Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture podcast in modern Europe, the first lecture podcast of module two. In this module, we're going to be taking a great big leap into the 19th century. Today, we're going to be talking about the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a massive economic and social change which first swept across Europe and then the rest of the world. Without exaggeration, it changed every aspect of the way we live our lives. And as modern people, I think it's hard for us to really imagine what the world was like prior to industrialization. So let's jump right in and get started. The learning objectives for this unit are, first, define and characterize the Industrial Revolution. Number two, understand the preconditions which led to the Industrial Revolution. Number three, recognize the specific elements which allowed Britain to industrialize first. And finally, examine the effects of industrialization and urbanization on European society. Today, we live in an incredibly complex world, an incredibly complex society. And when I say complex, I don't mean just technology. I mean complex in terms of our economy and in terms of our social rules. We as human beings have undergone a massive societal shift over the past 250 years. We went from a largely rural society in which most people were involved in some form of agriculture to one that was based in factories and the production of goods. This also meant a massive shift in where we lived as more and more people moved into cities and rural areas depopulated, a trend that continued around the world and continues to this day. Yet the process by which we industrialized has not always been easy, and it has brought with it its fair share of negative things as well. For example, in the 19th century, we saw massive increase in urban poverty and examples of child labor in factories under horrid conditions. Because Europe was the first area of the world to industrialize, it also meant that Europe was able to use their industrial might to build weapons and to exert their power all around the world in the form of imperialism. This, of course, brought with it decades upon decades of, of terrible oppression brought about by the years of imperialism. All of this, however, has led to, ultimately, the interconnected world that we live in today. This is all a result of the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution as being the most important change since the Agricultural Revolution 10,000 years earlier had seen us move from hunter-gatherer lifestyles to settled societies. While the Industrial Revolution changed industry and how we make things, it also brought about rapid and massive social change. It was during the Industrial Revolution that we began the worldwide human shift to an urban society. The Industrial Revolution also allowed for a population explosion and an overall rise in standard of living. The Industrial Revolution can be thought of as a shift in the energy sources for production. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, we relied almost entirely on either human or animal power to get things done. There are some exceptions, such as water wheels or windmills, but for the most part, it was humans or animals working. The Industrial Revolution shifted our power source to fossil fuels. Initially, this energy source was coal, but over time, petroleum and electricity would be used as well. The Industrial Revolution also brought about a fundamental shift in where we live. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the vast majority of people lived in rural locations. We were mostly farmers, and farming wasn't all that efficient. However, the Industrial Revolution brought increased efficiency and industrial processes to farming techniques, and at the same time reduced the number of people needed to farm. People began to move from the countryside into the city in search of work. A process that began in the late 1700s 
has only accelerated as the Industrial Revolution spread around the world. This is a graph representing the continuing worldwide move from rural to urban from 1950 and projected into the future. In 2012, we passed an important milestone. There are now more people living in urban environments around the world than rural ones. This trend is expected to continue into the future. By 2050, it is estimated that 70% of humans will be urban dwellers. The Industrial Revolution also represented an explosion in population. As industrial processes revolutionized farming and increased food supplies, increasing standards of living allowed more and more babies to survive infancy. You can see on this graph that human populations had a nice slow climb during the Middle Ages, then shoot up dramatically during the 20th century as the Industrial Revolution spread to every corner of the planet. Post-industrial societies are defined by two important characteristics. Number one, economic integration and specialization. We are all incredibly specialized and dependent on one another now. Think about how specialized your chosen profession is. How many of you grew up on a farm? How many of you are planning to be farmers? I suspect very few. The Industrial Revolution has allowed us to develop incredibly complex economies where most of us are very far removed from food production. This is a very recent phenomenon. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most of us would have had to have been farmers. It just wasn't that efficient. And there, now there are the resources to support a myriad of jobs that we have today. The second important characteristic is cultural integration and coordination. Our complex society has forced us to integrate and coordinate on unprecedented levels. This has created broad cultural integration. We are all participating in the same broad culture. We buy the same products, consume the same pop culture, and participate in the same governmental structures. Think for a moment what it takes for you to purchase a cup of tea at Tim Hortons. How complicated does our society have to be for such a product to exist for purchase? If you bought a cup of tea this morning, how many people were involved in this transaction? One, maybe two people at Tim Hortons? And say you paid roughly $2 for that tea. Some of that money is split between them to pay their salaries. How about their manager? Does he or she get a cut of your $2 too? Is that all? Where did the tea come from? Somewhere in the world, probably somewhere in Southeast Asia, a farmer was paid part of your $2 to grow the tea in the tea bag. It probably passed through hundreds of different middlemen, import companies, shipping companies, on its way to Canada. Each of them also takes a small sliver of your $2. No one is doing any of this for free. But what about the teacup? It's made out of paper. Someone at some point was paid a bit of your $2 to cut down a tree, which would eventually make the paper for the cup. What about the designers, the colors, the inks, and the other features? Companies were paid to do these things too. And your $2 goes to support that. The lid is made of plastic. A plastic company was paid to make it for Tim Hortons but they probably had to pay another company for the chemicals to make the plastics, and so on. What about even that little metal staple that holds the little piece of paper attached to the tea bag? Someone somewhere was paid to dig up and mine that metal out of the ground and smelt it into something that would eventually become your staple. I think you get the idea. No doubt tens of thousands of people were paid a small slice of your $2 just so you could have tea in the morning. This is the very definition of a complex economy that the Industrial Revolution made possible. So what was it like prior to industrialization? Well, as we've already said, nearly 
eighty percent of the population was involved in some form or fashion in agriculture and nearly ninety five percent of the population lived in a rural setting the other thing that you can think about is manufactured goods any manufactured goods generally were made at home or the local village this meant that anything you needed as a family you made at home so the mother might make the clothing for the family the father might actually build the house that you lived in there were some specialized items where you might have to purchase them from someone else such as a blacksmith to make say an iron tool and these were so valuable to a family because they were so expensive because they weren't made in a factory they were made by hand by an individual that you can see them in wills being passed down generation to generation things like cutlery things like a pot or a pan these were things that were expensive hard to make and something that you wanted to keep for a lifetime this is why we generally think of pre-industrial societies as characterized by scarcity when you compare a pre-industrial society to a modern industrialized society the difference is goods there are just no goods in the past if you went into a uh, wealthy nobles castle during the middle ages one of the things that might strike you is just how few things that noble would have owned because even though the noble might have lots of money there was very little things to buy because there's no factories turning out any goods at all this is pre-industrial europe so we already know that the Industrial Revolution begins in Europe, and it begins in the mid 1700s, specifically in Britain. The first industry to industrialize is the textile trade, that is the making of cloth, but other industries would follow quite quickly. And industrialization, once it gets going in the mid 1700s, will very quickly spread throughout Europe. Now, because Europe is the first part of the world to industrialize, this will have massive consequences to the overall balance of power in the world. So the Industrial Revolution would allow European countries to become imperial powers, and they would exert this power around the world, ushering in over a century of cruelty and oppression with the imperialism age. Nearly every European country by the year 1900 had begun to build some form of world empire. The areas of the world that were particularly impacted by European imperialism were Africa and Asia. So you might be wondering why Europe then? Why was Europe the first area of the world to industrialize? Well, I'll start by saying that it's not immediately obvious why it had to be Europe. There were several other areas of the world that had made major technological advances over the years that we might have imagined moving into industrialization, such as uh, China, such as India, such as the Middle East. However, it was Europe that was first. So why? When you look at Europe from a historical point of view in the early modern period, um, Europe really was relatively small and weak compared to other areas of the world and definitely very divided. The old idea that was often taught in history classes in the 20th century was that somehow Europe was culturally superior to the rest of the world or that Asia at that time was stagnating. And all of this really is just nonsense and not supported by any evidence whatsoever at all. But nevertheless, we're still left wondering why did Europe uh, industrialize first? Well, one possibility is looking at Europe as, in a sense, a failed pre-industrial state. Now, what do I mean by a failed pre-industrial state? Well, the fact that Europe was so divided amongst different countries with intense competition, both militaristic and economic between those countries, means that Europe was never able to create a cohesive whole the way other parts of the world did. And this may have been one factor that led to industrialization. So let's take a closer look at the preconditions that led to industrialization in Europe. By the 1700s, there were some distinctive characteristics in European society, which would ultimately lay the basis for industrialization. 
First of all, as I said, there was intense competition between states. There had been for centuries. If you have ever taken the first half of this course, Early Modern Europe, you'll see that pretty much in the 1500s and the 1600s and a good part of the 1700s, Europe is pretty much constantly at war with itself. Non-stop warfare for 300 years. Yet within each state, we see uh, emerging a centralized state power with very strong legal protections for private property. Now, why is that important? The protections for private property. Well, ultimately, industrialization won't be driven from the, by the state, but they'll be driven by entrepreneurial individuals. And without uh, protections, legal protections for private property, you're not going to see people investing uh, their money. And finally, there was also a history within Europe of challenges to both religious and political power. As we've already seen in this course, we talked about the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And prior to that, we had things like the Protestant Reformation. All of these favored um, uh, a, a, an environment in which uh, innovation might happen. One of the most important preconditions to industrialization in Europe were changes in agriculture. In the 18th century, Europe underwent an agricultural revolution. Farming was able to produce more food with less people involved. And this was because of a variety of factors. First, there was better technology brought in, such as improved plows, or as you see in the picture here, um, new machines such as the seed drill, which improved farming productivity. There's also a little bit of luck involved. Between the years 1715 and 1750, there were particularly good harvest conditions in Europe, and this also led to a surplus of food. We also see by the mid-18th century, there is the introduction of new world crops, such as potatoes and maize. These are plants that were domesticated by the indigenous peoples of the Americas and were unknown to Europeans during the Middle Ages. Some of these crops, such as potatoes and maize, are particularly nutritious, and so growing them in Europe led to a population increase. So once we get into the mid-18th century, what we start to see is an ever larger pool of poor and landless peasants. They are no longer needed on farms, and so many of them are moving to cities looking for work. The population of Europe doubles between 1715 and 1850. It is this large, um, body of workers that will provide the base upon which industrialization is possible. So we've talked about some of the preconditions in Europe which led to industrialization, but what about the place where industrialization first started within Europe? What about Britain? Why was it Britain uh, that industrialization first took place there? Well, first of all, we can say that in Britain, we see the same demographic change that we see elsewhere in Europe that was brought about by the 18th century agricultural revolution. And so that is that we see a rapidly growing population and one that is moving from the countryside into the city. However, there are also some differences between Britain and the rest of Europe. Relatively speaking, within British society, there was a little bit more social mobility and tolerance than was usual for the time. And of course, it's that little bit of wiggle room that gives us the ability to see some entrepreneurs uh, start to stake out um, new businesses. And Britain is relatively small, and so it's easy to transport goods from one production centre to another centre. Also, relatively speaking, Britain had few toll roads, and this also meant for cheaper transportation. Britain, of course, is also rich in coal and iron resources, and it would be coal in particular which would be the engine of the Industrial Revolution. Also, Britain had a well-developed banking system at the time. And of course, if you are going to be an entrepreneur and start a factory, you will need credit for ventures like that. And so the banking system in Britain was able to provide that type of credit. And finally, overall, wages were a little bit higher in Britain. And the way that wages encouraged industrialization is people don't want to pay higher wages. And so if they can figure out a way to use less people to produce goods, perhaps making a machine do it instead, well, that's going to be something that you're going to do. So for all of these reasons, Britain was the first country in Europe to industrialize.
So we said that the first industry within Britain to industrialize was the textile industry, that is the cloth making industry. And there's a lot of reasons why this industry in particular was ripe for industrialization. So when we look at textile making or weaving, as you might call it, in the Middle Ages, um, we can see some of the reasons why um, it would be an industry that you would want to industrialize. So first of all, it was incredibly labor intensive. Um, most weaving during the Middle Ages in the early modern period was done at home by a weaver, either a specialist if they were selling out of the home um, and therefore a member of a guild or women if it was just for family use. All of the cloth that would have been actually sold at market was controlled by trade guilds who controlled uh, the quality and all of the training associated with making cloth. And to become a member of the guild and produce cloth for the market required years of training and apprenticeships, eventually working your way up where you would become a master. So if you can imagine, all of that human effort involved in making cloth made it relatively very, very expensive. By the 18th century, there was an increasing market for cloth in Europe and overseas. And all of this was putting pressure on this very, very small labor intensive economy that had existed since the Middle Ages. European colonies now needed finished cloth and so did armies as well. This led to the development of something that you might sort of think of as almost an 18th century gig economy, and that was the system of putting out. The putting out industry essentially was a network of home weavers where um, the uh, merchant would go around to various houses collecting all of the cloth that various home weavers um, uh, made. He would, they would sell it to him and then he would bring it all the way to market. This was called a system of putting out, but it really didn't do anything about the labor intensiveness of the actual product. And so it was still ripe for some form of uh, innovation, which would um, speed up the process and make it cheaper to produce. This uh, is what we will see when the Industrial Revolution begins. So it was the textile industry, the labor intensive, human labor intensive textile industry in which the Industrial Revolution would take place and it would be in Britain where it would happen first. Mass production began in the British textile industry when we see the introduction of new labor saving machines such as this one. This is the spinning jenny. It was invented in 1764 and it's one of the innovations that started the revolution. Now I've included this week in the recommended videos a short video which demonstrates how the spinning jenny worked and how it could allow a weaver to be far more productive in their work. It was really just the first step. Many more machines would follow after that. Eventually, the human component would be removed and we would see coal and steam being used as the energy source to drive these machines. This was the beginning of factories. Other industries began to adopt the same ideas from the weaving industry, and then we really see the Industrial Revolution take off. It begins to spread beyond Brit uh, British borders, and all European countries very quickly begin to industrialize by the end of the 18th century. So we've said that one of the ways that we can look at the Industrial Revolution is as a shift from using human and animal power to using the power of fossil fuels. And nowhere is this more clear than in the adoption of the steam engine uh, powered by coal, which would come to dominate um, factories and machines of the 19th century in the later Industrial Revolution. So the first thing you should realize is both coal and steam do have ancient origins. Uh, they weren't invented in the 18th century. Uh, Romans, for example, uh, used coal and coal was used uh, throughout the Middle Ages in, in blacksmith shops, for example. But we do start to see in the 18th century an increasing demand for coal. Um, this is partially as a result of deforestation in Britain, which led um, uh, coal to be preferred as a fuel and heat over wood uh, due to expense. However, coal mines had one major limit, and that is that the deeper that they went in Britain, they tended to always flood. 
The steam engine ended up providing the solution. In 1712, a man named Thomas Newcomen invented a simple single piston steam engine pump. And this was the first machine to successfully direct steam to produce work. It was able to uh, take water out of these mines and allowed coal mines to be dug even deeper. You see an image in front of you of the Newcomen uh, pump in about 1780. And this meant that the steam engine and the coal industry were inextricably tied to one another. Eventually, the steam engine would be put to many other uses, such as in factories, but also in a new type of transportation, which began to appear in the 18th century, and that is the train. Here you see one of the first railroads from Manchester to Liverpool, England. Railroad roads would accelerate the production of the Industrial Revolution. They facilitated not only the moving of products and resources, but also people and communication. So there are, of course, many consequences to the Industrial Revolution. And this is a topic that we're going to be returning to again as we see the effects of the Industrial Revolution ripple out over the next century. Uh, there would be both good and bad consequences. At the very least, we see an unprecedented development of new technologies and goods as a result of the Industrial Revolution. We also see this massive shift from living in a rural environment to one of an urban environment. We'll see massive urban urbanization and cities grow across Europe incredibly uh, between 1750 and 1850. Along with this growth in cities, we also see some of the social ills that come with it, slums, disease, and pollution. The Industrial Revolution also heralds new social classes. We see the end of the craftsmen as a primary means of production, and instead replaced by workers who are dependent on factory wages, people that Karl Marx will refer to as the proletariat. At the same time, we'll see a growing power of the bourgeoisie or the middle class, these non-aristocratic people who have acquired wealth through trade, finance, and manufacturing. Over the 19th century, they're going to increasingly demand a say in government that they didn't have before. We'll also see European economic and military dominance over the rest of the world as the Industrial Revolution equips them with the power to do so. And finally, we'll also see environmental destruction on an incredible scale throughout the 19th century. So that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to go back to revolution. We're going to see how the ideas of the French Revolution never really went away and will flower up again in the middle of the 19th century in the revolutions of 1848. Revolutions which will spread to nearly every major city in Europe and turn the continent upside down. Have a great week and I'll see you next time.